The main constraint in software development is learning, but your company is designed for a previous century based on hierarchy, productivity, and individual objectives. Scrum is optimized for knowledge creation and collaborative invention, so it contradicts your organization's current policies, habits, and structure. These things are hard to change, so most people just rename their current practices to Scrum. I made these lessons to help you challenge fake Scrum. Welcome to Module 1 of Scrum Training Series, Introduction to Scrum. This is a brief introduction to topics that are covered in greater depth in the other modules. I'm Michael James, or MJ. I help organizations do Scrum and related agile practices. This module is subdivided into three chapters. At the end, you'll find a challenging quiz that's been shown to increase scores on certification tests and may be a prerequisite for your certification class. I also recommend downloading the six-page illustrated Scrum reference card. Scrum is a framework for dealing with complex work such as new product development. It is an alternative to traditional approaches that were more suited to manufacturing and construction. Why do you need an alternative? In the previous century, most people's work required more of a focus on execution than innovation. People with defined roles used defined models and defined best practices to execute defined plans that didn't change very quickly. Life was more predictable because we knew more about what we were trying to accomplish and how we would accomplish it. People like Henry Ford used ideas from Frederick Taylor and H.L. Gantt to do predictable or repeatable work. Today, a lot of the predictable, repeatable work is done much faster by machines. Things change more quickly. To stay competitive, we need to inspect and adapt more quickly and deal with greater uncertainty. A transparent framework imposing time boxes and feedback loops can help us master uncertainty. Only learning organizations will be able to keep up with the future. Scrum is a framework for learning about work and the processes we use to do it. It's an attempt to put chaos in a box, making the most of uncertainty. While it's mostly been used for developing new software products, it may be useful for other kinds of complex work. Scrum introduces feedback loops, encouraging us to inspect and adapt the product that we're building and the processes we're using to build that product. Scrum is associated with the Agile movement described at agilemanifesto.org. We value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. This doesn't mean we don't value the things on the right. We do value the things on the left more. Early in our product development cycle, we will want to see some features working rather than one huge release at the end. Ideally, we'd be able to continue incremental improvements indefinitely. Each sprint, we learn more about customer needs and change course a little or a lot. Product development is ongoing with frequent releases rather than a one-shot project. Here's what Scrum is not. The attempt to use traditional Gantt ideas for developing software was first described by Dr. Winston Royce in 1970. He drew a picture, a bit like this one, showing a series of phases. One phase connects to the next phase, connects to the next phase, and each one has a handoff. In theory, you'd do all your analysis in the beginning, get that completely done, and then you'd start on your design, get that completely done, then start on your code, get that all the way done, and then integrate, etc. That was a nice theory about how things could work, and we suppose it could work if we had perfect knowledge in the beginning and never made mistakes along the way. The next sentence in Dr. Winston Royce's paper, unfortunately no one read this far, said, I believe in this concept, but the implementation described above is risky and invites failure. The reason it fails for complex work, we rarely have perfect knowledge at the beginning. In fact, we know less about our project when we're starting out than we're ever going to know in the future. Today is the dumbest day of the rest of our project. But a plan-driven approach requires us to make our most important decisions right at the beginning when we know the least. Waterfall projects eventually descend into anarchy when the actual work finally happens with low quality and too much overtime. Scrum throws all those phases in the blender. All the ingredients are mixed into every sprint. Instead of dividing the work into activity-specific phases, we divide it into fixed-length iterations called sprints. Every sprint contains some combination of analysis, design, actual implementation, testing, learning about customer needs, and planning for the future. Maybe we'll actually be deploying or shipping more frequently. Right from the first sprint, a Scrum team tries to build a working, tested, potentially shippable product increment even if it starts out small. Every sprint, they demonstrate what little bit of shippable product they have to everyone. Customers often need to see the wrong product before they can specify what they really need. 
With short iterations and more feedback, we have a better chance of discovering the right product. While the product owner doesn't actually have to ship every sprint, it's the team's job to make this possible. To make a shippable product every two weeks, we're going to want people with skills in testing, in design, in business requirements, in coding, all in one cross-functional, self-organizing team. Now, instead of waiting for the end to start our testing, we'll start testing with our very first sprint. Instead of doing all the design up front, we'll do a bit of design every sprint until it becomes continuous design. We'll do small amounts of continuous redesign and refactoring to avoid technical debt. Every sprint combines all aspects of the work. A Scrum team should collaborate together instead of working in phases with handoffs. Scrum provides a structure of roles, meetings, rules, and artifacts. Let's do a quick overview of them now. There are only three roles defined by Scrum, and we'll go through each one. Product Owner, Scrum Development Team, Scrum Master. The product owner is the single individual responsible for return on investment, or ROI, of the product development effort. The product owner mostly exerts that influence through the prioritization of the product backlog. The product owner is the final arbiter of requirements questions. That doesn't mean he or she will give you all the detailed requirements up front or even all the details at the beginning of every sprint, but the product owner does make the final call about those things. The product owner must have the vision behind product development. Given high uncertainty, it often doesn't make sense to have a detailed roadmap, but a vision is important. If anyone wants anything from the team, they need to work through the product owner to get what they want. He or she is the one person making prioritization decisions. The product owner makes the business decisions focused more on the what than on the how. In large-scale Scrum, there's only one product owner for multiple development teams. The Scrum development team is a cross-functional group responsible for self-organizing to develop a shippable product every sprint. This is hard to do in the beginning, and today more and more teams are learning how to do it. You don't want to be the last team that learns how to do this. Organizations use the word team lightly. Think back to a time in your life you were on a real team when you could count on each other. That's the kind of Scrum team I want you to create. If we keep the same team together in the right environment full-time with effective retrospectives, sprint after sprint, they'll probably get better at working with each other. They may become a learning team, the building block of a learning organization. There are no externally imposed hierarchy or job titles on this team. We leave openings for leadership to emerge naturally and for control to flow from person to person. The Scrum Development Team is a small group, no more than nine people. We have millions of years of practice dealing with groups about the size of a family. Large groups don't self-organize effectively until they divide into smaller teams. In large-scale Scrum, full-stack feature teams pull their work from one product backlog and integrate their work every sprint. Team collaboration emerges most naturally in a team room. If your organization is spread around the world, you're probably already suffering poor collaboration and coordination. Scrum will quickly bring this problem to the surface. You may experience breakthroughs by getting your remote people into one room for one or two sprints in the beginning and then every few months after that. Information sharing tools by themselves don't transform organizations and sometimes make things worse. The Scrum Master is the most misunderstood role in Scrum. If I'm your Scrum Master, you're not my Scrum slave. It's the opposite. The Scrum Master has no management authority over the team. If you are the project manager or line manager of the team, by definition, you are not the Scrum Master. Scrum intentionally leaves out the project manager role. The responsibilities of project management are split up among the product owner and the team, with the Scrum Master acting as a kind of facilitator. The Scrum Master protects the team from distractions and interruptions, gets things out of the way of natural team self-organization, removes impediments affecting the team, facilitates the process, helps teach people how to use Scrum, promotes improved engineering practices, time boxes, provides visibility, and somehow does all this without any management power. It turns out power isn't even the most powerful type of influence. Eventually, the team and the product owner don't need as much of the Scrum Master's focus. A good Scrum Master does not make the team do Scrum. Good developers already want to learn and collaborate instead of being directly managed. A good Scrum Master makes it possible for teams to do Scrum by influencing the organization's policies and structure. For further information on the elusive Scrum Master role, see the example Scrum Master's checklist an example list of things the Scrum Master would be concerned with fixing. Two important artifacts in Scrum are the product backlog and the sprint backlog. 
The product backlog is a one-dimensional, forest-ranked list of customer-centric features prioritized by the product owner. It's a list of everything we might ever do. If it's not in the backlog, it doesn't exist. Anyone can add items to the product backlog, but the product owner's got to prioritize them and the Scrum Master's got to make it visible. A well-formed product backlog does not contain tasks, only well-formed product backlog items, or PBIs, which might be written in user story form or maybe use case scenarios. Force ranked means there's only one thing in the top position. Getting organizations to do this is usually a breakthrough. When multiple teams work on the product, there's still only one product backlog. The sprint backlog is what we are planning to do right now to meet our current sprint goal. It has an end date. It has a subset of product backlog items selected for the sprint and a plan for how to do them, such as a list of sprint tasks. Multiple teams maintain their own separate sprint backlogs even if they're working on the same product. Now let's have an overview of the meetings in Scrum. There are four meetings defined by Scrum and a fifth one that just about everyone has found useful to do. The four meetings defined by Scrum, the sprint planning meeting, the daily Scrum, the sprint review meeting, and the sprint retrospective meeting. The fifth one has no official name, so we'll call it the backlog refinement meeting. Here's an example of how those meetings might fit into a two-week sprint. I personally like to end the sprint on a Friday so we're not working over the weekend. At the planning meeting, the team and the product owner choose which items to attempt in the sprint. The team pulls selected items into the sprint backlog, plans how they will do them, and decides whether it's the right amount of work for them to do. They plan one sprint. In large-scale Scrum, multiple dev teams pull work from the same product backlog into multiple sprint backlogs. They plan to collaborate as a team of teams without intermediate coordinators. During sprint execution, the team meets once per day for a 15-minute daily scrum. If we're collaborating, we're meeting all the time, of course, but this one official meeting is defined where we stand up and find ways to help each other. We talk to each other, not to the scrum master, not to the product owner, not to any kind of boss, but the team. I talk to the six other people that are my team members. I look them in the eye and tell them what I did yesterday, tell them what I'm going to do today, and what impedes me. What are my blockers? Then I toss the ball to someone else on my team, and they talk to the rest of the team. In large-scale Scrum, each team has its own daily Scrum and then uses various other collaboration patterns to work with the other teams. All coordination responsibility belongs to self-organizing teams, so there's no release train engineer or other management-assigned coordination roles. The Scrum Master tries to enable self-managing teams, so a good Scrum Master would never do the actual coordination. The Scrum Master should help teams learn continuous integration on the trunk, test-driven development, and other modern development practices. The purpose of a sprint review is to inspect and adapt the product. The team demonstrates a potentially shippable product increment to anyone who's interested, ideally customers and end users. We get feedback from stakeholders allowing us to inspect and adapt our plans for future development. A lot of times the feedback is, hey, you did what you said you do, but now that we see it, we realize we need something else. And we couldn't have known that until we saw the wrong product. People seem to need a functioning piece of software to react against before they can specify what they really want. In large-scale Scrum, there's one sprint review of the multi-team integrated product. Regular sprint review meetings provide feedback about the product and its emerging requirements. Every sprint ends with a sprint retrospective meeting for the team to inspect and adapt their own process. We inspect and adapt the way we work together during the last iteration. We typically talk about what went well and what can be improved, what we learned, what still puzzles us. We give feedback to each other. These kinds of things will come up in the retrospective. Some practical techniques for doing this well are covered in Module 6. This is really the key of the whole thing. The team eventually takes ownership of their own process. Regular sprint retrospectives provide feedback about the process the team uses to build the product. Remember, Scrum was a framework for learning about products and the processes we use to build them. In large-scale Scrum, teams also have their own retrospectives. Afterwards, they conduct an overall retrospective with each other, the product owner, Scrum masters, and managers if there are any. The overall retrospective explores systemic and organizational issues affecting multiple teams. The fifth meeting isn't given a name officially in Scrum. I'm going to call it the Backlog Refinement Meeting. It might also be called Backlog Grooming, or maybe we'd do some of this work in a release planning meeting. During Backlog Refinement, the team and the product owner get together and they look ahead a little bit into the next few items in the product backlog, the items that are candidates for the next couple sprints. They clarify them, Break the big product backlog items, or epics, into smaller product backlog items, for example, user stories, so they could imagine doing a few of them in one sprint. 
They get some input about prioritization, they consider dependencies, etc. While this work could also be done in the sprint planning meeting, through experience, people have found it preferable to do in a separate meeting on a different day. Unlike most Scrum trainers, I'm going to measure your knowledge of these six modules in the classroom. In other words, I will test you during the class. You show up already knowing the basics, then we spend most of the classroom time in team activities that go way beyond them. Let me know how you do on the following quiz before coming to class so I can help you with any confusion before it causes any problems in the class. If my version of English isn't the language you grew up with, remember to slow down on this quiz and later during the classroom tests. If you're not already signed up and you think you might want to, here's how to reach me. Most of my public classes are in the U.S. I'm in Asia a couple months a year, and I've helped people in about 20 other countries, anywhere that has good food or, failing that, at least good beer. Now that was a brief overview of Scrum. To learn a little more about Scrum, download the Scrum Reference Card and the Scrum Master's Checklist. To learn a lot more about Scrum, attend one of our Scrum classes or try our other training modules that go into more depth. Also drop us a line to give us feedback on this training module.